up red. Pick up red, everybody. I don't know what it's like where you are, and I don't mean to gloat, but uh, uh, the Scriveners, we will be having toast tonight. So, uh, that's something, isn't it, uh, in this time of scarcity. Um, you know, they, they say that even though supermarket shelves are empty, or well, so many of them are, you know, actually, there's a billion pounds extra food in people's houses, extra to what there was just three weeks ago. It's basically like having the demand of Christmas, but without the supply chain being ready for it. But that's okay. That's okay. Um, we'll figure it out. And uh, it's, it's kind of putting all the supermarket managers in the position of being Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life. You know, saying, I, I don't have your toilet roll. It's in Bill's house and, and Jenny's house. Because, um, yeah, there is enough. There is enough. But we're living with a scarcity mindset and therefore the temptation is always to to hoard um, and of course what comes with that scarcity mindset is then kind of government pronouncements about what we are to do the loving thing to do is not to stockpile it's not to hoard so perhaps you've seen the um, social media kind of video you know a nurse knocking off from just a sapping shift battling coronavirus and then going to the shops and seeing that the cupboard is bare and just in tears because well because we've hoarded and actually those who've most needed the supplies are, are those who are going without even as they give themselves and we all think that's not right and so government spokespeople come on TV and they say, no, thou shalt not hoard. And that is the law, and the law is good. It is describing our situation of scarcity, and it is telling us what to do in order to love our neighbor. The law is good. But when the law comes in contact with scarcity, when the law comes in contact with existential dread, who will win? What's going to win in a fight between the law and fear? Uh, every single time, fear wins, and not the law. The law, this description of what we ought to be like, the best version of ourselves, um, that is good. That is a true description of what life should be like but it has no power to change us. Being told by a government spokesperson not to hoard, it, it doesn't change us. And, and we know that, don't we? You know, it's been hilarious for me, like seeing how on Twitter, everyone is blaming the empty shelves on like one or two phantom hoarders. And actually social media has been good enough to supply for us a number of scapegoats that we can all point our finger to and say, ah, that person, she is the one, he is the one who is stockpiling all the toilet roll. Um, and there have been a number of scapegoats sort of offered up to us. But as we point the finger at those scapegoats, there are three fingers pointing straight back at all of us. It's not that there's one person or that, you know, <laughs> you don't have just a couple of hoarders in your town and they are the reason why you don't have hand sanitizer anymore. <laughs> it's like everyone is taking just a little bit more. Just a, we're, we're all treating it like it's Christmas because, you know, you know at Christmas how you get in enough food for three months, even though literally the shops are closed for about 36 hours. Um, we've all done that. We've all done that. We are the hoarders, okay? We are the hoarders. You know, just last night I was um, getting some uh, flowers for Mother's Day uh, and, uh, and I got the kids some presents to give my wife and uh, and I was thinking do we have sellotape or not and so I was standing in front of the sellotape in this supermarket and th there were a number of sellotape rolls it's it's not like I was taking the last one but I, I suddenly started to think oh my goodness am I hoarding if I buy this sellotape will this mean somehow that somewhere people go without and, and, and at this time of coronavirus Everything gets heightened, everything gets intensified, so that I will survive if I just have enough baby wipes, <laughs> you know? Or if I take too many apples, am I, 
Am I putting people at risk? Is, is this killing people? And literally, I was standing in front of a shelf full of sellotape and thinking to myself, am I killing somebody by taking, you know, and we, and we invest in the law, powers that are just not there. The law, the rules for how life works best, is a powerful thing. And it's amazing how we cling to it at these times of scarcity. How we, you know, it's absolutely right to wash our hands and let's keep washing our hands and let's do it for 20 seconds and let's, you know, you can sing happy birthday twice or you can say the Lord's Prayer. That would be a cool thing to do. Um, but we invest these things with I- immense power. And I, and I know that at a, at, a, uh, at a societal level, it's a great thing to do and it should be done. But they, these things can become in our hearts, things that we cling on to and we feel like we will survive if only we keep the law in a particular way. But when the law comes up against existential dread, who's going to win? Who's going to win in a fight between the law and fear? It's fear every single time. Let me give you two scenarios, okay? Let's imagine that we're all on a ship and the ship goes down. We're somewhere in, let's say, I don't know, let's, we're somewhere in the Pacific Ocean and the ship goes down and uh, I'll give you two scenarios, okay? Scenario one, the ship is going down, you go past your cabin and you grab a little bag of supplies. I mean, I don't know why you're on a cruise ship at this time with the, with the global pandemic. I don't know what you're doing, you selfish so-and-so, but let's imagine it, okay? You go past your cabin, you pick up a bag of supplies. I don't know, some biscuits, some tinned ham, maybe spam, maybe tuna, something like that, and some bottled water. You put it into a bag and you get onto the lifeboat. Well, the ship sinks and you're on the lifeboat and you're bobbing up and down on the sea for a night and a day and then somebody spots land and people say quick let's let's paddle towards the land and so you paddle towards the land as it gets closer and closer you realize it's not really an island what you're witnessing is basically a bare rock in the middle of the pacific ocean there's no life on it whatsoever but it's the only place you can see so you paddle towards it and as you're paddling towards it the guy next to you says Gee, I'm thirsty. What do you do? What do you do in scenario one? Do you share the water? Do you break open the bag and say spam for everybody? That's scenario one. Now you know what the law is. You know that you shouldn't be a selfish so-and-so, right? You, you, You know that you ought to share. That is the good thing to do. But in a, fa- in a fight against the law and fear, what wins? So that's scenario one. Scenario two, same deal. You're on the cruise ship. I don't know why you're on a cruise ship. Stop going on cruise ships, honestly. But the ship goes down. And you go past your cabin, you grab a bag of supplies. Bottled water, biscuits, tinned ham, spam, tuna, that sort of thing. And so you've got your bag, you smuggle it on board to this lifeboat, and there you are in the lifeboat. The ship goes down, you're bobbing up and down a night and a day in the open sea. And then you see land in the distance, and you start paddling towards it. But this time, as you start paddling towards it, you see this is a tropical paradise. You, you see the waterfall gushing. You see the, the trees hanging heavy with fruits. And you realize this is not a desert island you're going towards. This is an island paradise. It's tremendous. Salvation. It's going to be okay. And you're all in ter- tremendous spirits. And as you're paddling towards this tropical paradise, the guy next to you says, Gee, I'm thirsty. What do you do in scenario two? What do you do in scenario two? Uh, <laughs> Surely, in scenario two, you are far more likely to bust out the spam and say, tinned meat for everybody. Surely, in scenario two, you're going to share the little bits of water that you have. Because you see an abundance of provision. You see an overflowing fountain of life. And you know that it's yours. You know that you're safe. You know that ultimately everything's going to be okay. And so you share the wealth. You do not hoard. 
what is it that is different between those two scenarios? What's, what's changed? The law hasn't changed. Your knowledge of what you should do has not changed. What has changed has been your vision. You have seen a vision of abundance. And that's what's transformed you. And the law can't do that. You need a new vision for what will change you. You know, at the beginning of uh, the book of John, I, I don't know if you're a Christian or a believer or if you're familiar with the Bible at all, but um, there's this famous bit from the most famous book of the Bible. Um, and it's, it's the most famous chapter from the most famous part of the world's all-time bestseller. It's John chapter 1. And there's this great line, and, uh, and it basically goes through these two scenarios. And it says, uh, The law came through Moses... Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through, through Jesus Christ. Moses is the great law guy. He, he is the guy who went up on Mount Sinai and he received the Ten Commandments. You know, these, these 12, or <laughs> I was about to say 12 rules for life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, it, it's very Jordan Peterson. It's, very, it's an antidote to chaos. Okay, you've got the, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Rules for Life. Let's call them that. Moses receives the ten rules for life, and they are good, okay? They're all about loving God and loving other people, and uh, that is the good life, you know, to receive from God, pass it on to the, to the world. That is the good life. It is a description of the good life. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John's Gospel says that from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. So what you've got with Jesus is a, a situation of abundance. What you've got with Jesus is, is a fountain poured out. What you've got with Moses is the administration of scarcity. That's kind of what the law is. The law is looking down on our human arrangements. It's looking down on our biological needs. It's looking, but it's looking down on what the Bible calls the flesh. Okay. The flesh is our biological reality. It's the fact that we are frail, we are fragile. It's the fact that, you know, if you put, if someone puts them, their hand right here <laughs> and squeezes your nostrils, you have but a breath in your nostrils. And if someone squeezes the life out of that, you are worm food within minutes, okay? The flesh is our frail, fragile humanity. It's also our fallen and selfish reality. And the law administrates that realm of the flesh. The law tells you don't hoard. The law tells you to still be loving and not to be a selfish so-and-so in the midst of, of all that. And so Moses is this great administrator of the law. And there's a, a tremendous part of the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 16 where you, you, you see a situation of scarcity. Do you know the Old Testament story? So God's people, the children of Israel, that will become important. The children of Israel are saved out of slavery in Egypt, okay? And they are brought through the Red Sea. Do you know the moment? Charlton Heston playing Moses. He parts the Red Sea. And the people come out of their situation of slavery. They are promised a future of a land flowing with milk and honey. That's what they've promised. They're promised an abundance. They're promised the tropical island, a land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land. But they don't go from slavery straight into the promised land. In, instead, they go into the desert. And in fact, they go into the desert for 40 years of scarcity. And there they are, two million of them, the children of Israel. And they are given this regime of life coaching for how to deal with scarcity. And this object lesson in how to deal with scarcity is all about manna. Do you know what manna is? Um, manna in Exodus chapter 16 is the bread of heaven. Um, do you know the hymn? Bread of heaven, bread of heaven. If you're Welsh, you, if this is your birthright, you need to, you need to know this, this song, Bread of Heaven. And it's based on this, this story in Exodus chapter 16, where God's people are hungry and thirsty in the desert, and they grumble. And what's fascinating is uh, every time in the Bible when God's people grumble, 
once they've been given the law, once they've been given the Ten Commandments, every time they grumble, it is met by judgment from God. But when they don't have the law, when they're not in that situation of being under the Ten Rules for Life, um, whenever they grumble, they're just met with grace, incredible grace. God's people in Exodus chapter 16 grumble and they say, we're starving to death. What's God done? You know, he's, he's saved us out of slavery only to have us perish in the wilderness. Some kind of savior. So what does God do in response to their grumbling? He showers them with grace. And so, you know, it's, it's this incredible scene. They're grumbling, they're shaking their fist at God. And God rains down from heaven. What? Judgment? A thunderbolt? No, he rains down from heaven bread. And it's this incredible bread that tastes a bit like milk and honey. Later on in the Bible, it says that the, the, the manna is the bread of angels, and it, and it tastes like bread and honey, like, like milk and honey, which is a taste of the future. Okay, So God's giving them these little morsels, these little appetizers for the future that they're going to inherit. But through the manna, through this bread of heaven, God is teaching them a regime. It's life coaching. And what happens is every day God provides just enough. And the Bible says those who go out and collect too much, they did not have too much when they go home. Those who go out and collect too little, they didn't have too little when they go home. God, God is teaching this. How, he's teaching them how to deal with, with scarcity. And he imposes some rules. So what's fascinating is those who go out and hoard, right, when they get home, all the extra stuff has maggots in it. It's, it's a fascinating lesson in not hoarding. Okay, here, here is the great thou shalt. And wouldn't it be amazing if, if today all those people who took too much toilet roll, you know, when they, when they got home, they, they just found that it, it had pulped itself and it was, it was useless to them. All those people who, you know, had, you know, they, they took 17 bags of, of apples, you know, they bit into them and there were worms. Um, that, that would be kind of poetic justice. Well, this is what happened to the children of Israel. All who hoarded got maggots. And then, interestingly, God did give them a day off, this special Sabbath day, a day of rest. And he did not want them going out and working on the Sabbath day. He did not want them collecting the manna. So he, he provided twice as much on the day before. And then they are meant to stay at home. They're meant to self-isolate. They're meant to lock down. <laughs> and rest on that holy day. But what's fascinating is those who don't like resting, those who um, step out of their self-isolation and go to find more food, there is no more food. Again, poetic justice. Those who hoard get maggots. Those who venture out of the home when they should be staying in, they find nothing poetic justice. And for 40 years, the children of Abraham, or rather the children of, of Mo, the children of Israel, let's say, for, for 40 years, the children of Israel were being given this discipleship program, this, this kind of life coaching regime. And then in Galatians, uh, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says, the children of Israel were under a school teacher. And they were under this school teacher um, as this regime that would bring them to maturity when Christ came. So that, that is the great hope. They were, the Old Testament is about children growing up under the law, under these rules, under this regime of life coaching, so that they achieve maturity. And the law is meant to deliver people to Christ. Because if Israel were children, Christ is the Son, the Son of God. And the Bible says, when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. So here comes Jesus in the New Testament, and he proves to be the mature human being. He, he proves to be the person who knows how to live wisely in a time of scarcity. And one of the first things that Jesus does is go into the wilderness for 40 days and tackle temptation. And in this time of scarcity, he proves himself not to have a scarcity mindset. He, he proves himself not to grasp, not to hoard, 
but to continue to trust God and, and to continue to live the life of love, even under scarcity provisions. And so you think, okay, so Jesus comes along as the mature one, the son of God, amidst a whole bunch of children who don't know how to live with scarcity. Yeah, but it's far more than that. Jesus is not just another example of how to live under the law, okay? He is not just another Moses. He is not just law covered over in skin. He's not law covered over in skin. He's love covered over in skin. That's who he is. He's, he's different from Moses. He is not another, he's not another administrator of scarcity. He is God's provision. So in John chapter 6, there's this incredible scene where Jesus feeds a multitude in the wilderness. And you think, hello, that's Exodus 16. He's doing God's part in Exodus chapter 16. He is feeding the hungry in the wilderness with miraculous bread. And even in that chapter, he declares himself continually to be the I am. And you know, the I am, if you know anything about the Moses story, that's God's name. God in the burning bush declares himself to Moses to be the I am. And Jesus keeps saying, I am to the people. And the people keep grumbling in the wilderness in John chapter 6. And Jesus feeds them with bread miraculously. And you're thinking, ah, Jesus is not another Moses. He's not someone who just administrates the scarcity. He's someone who brings the bread. In fact, he is the bread. In John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Jesus is God's provision. He is the fountain, right? He's the fountain. But what's fascinating is, okay, how is the fountain going to provide for us? Here we are on planet Earth living in scarcity. We are all on a desert island. What is it that's going to bring the fountain? Jesus is. Apparently, Jesus is the fountain to bring abundance. How does he do it? It's fascinating. In John chapter 6, verse 51, he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. And right there, Jesus, Jesus is both mighty and meek. Never has anyone claimed to be so mighty and so meek in the same breath. John 6 verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Because you're like, well, how are you going to feed the whole world? And Jesus says, I am the bread. I am the provision. And you, you know what happens, if, even if you don't know anything about, about church and that kind of stuff. You, do you know about the Last Supper? You know, you know Da Vinci's Last Supper. You, you know the great painting, and there is Jesus at the table, and you're all thinking, why is no one sitting on the other side of the table? This is, this is a funny seating arrangement, but, but there they are, posing for Da Vinci. And Jesus is at the Last Supper, and what does he do? He, he takes bread, and he says, this is my body and then breaks it apart in front of them. It's, it's the most visceral demonstration of the death he is going to die the next, the next morning. He holds up bread, says, this is my hill. Holds up, he holds up bread, and he tears it apart. This is my body, right? This is what will happen to me. This is what will feed the world. And then he picks up wine, and he pours it out, and he says, this is my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And what's he telling us? He's telling us that he is the great provision of God. He's not just an administrator of scarcity. He is provision for those who are in a desert place. And the way he feeds the hungry is, being, is by being torn apart like bread. The way he slakes the thirst of those who are perishing is he will pour out his life with every drop of his blood. Because that's the way he will prove himself to be the fountain. You might sit there and you, and you might think, we are, in a we are in a position of scarcity. I need to know provision. I need to know abundance. I need to know that there's hope beyond this frail, failing flesh. And I'm telling you, there is a fountain. A fountain that will provide eternally 
for everyone who comes to him. And you think, well, how does he provide? Well, he provides by being poured out. How do you, how do you know a fountain truly? Where do you see a fountain most truly? You see it where it is poured out. And where do you see God most truly? According to the Bible, you see God most truly when you see him poured out with every drop of his blood. What is the great proof that Jesus is the I am? You know, does he, does he pull off a, a miraculous rearrangement of the stars in the heavens? Does he, does he make mountains blow their top and, and, you know, instant volcano, see? See my power, I am God. That is not the way that Jesus proves himself to be God. He doesn't do freaky stuff to prove that he's God. You know the great proof that Jesus is God? It's his death. And you think, that's, that's crazy. How can his death be proof that he is God? <laughs> right? God is the author of life. How can him dying prove that he's the author of life? Ah, but don't you get it? Where do you see a fountain except where it's poured out? And where do you see God except when he is poured out with every drop of his blood? He proves that he is the author of life by gushing that life out of him. He proves that he's God by dying. He proves that he's not just an administrator of scarcity. He proves that he is the provision of God by exhausting himself for you and for me. You know, we are in a time of scarcity. All of us are in a, in a time of great, great scarcity. We're all running out of stuff. You know, I've got my, I've got my bread. I've got my bread, but for how much longer? You know, how many slices in a, in a loaf of bread? How many, how many slices, how many rounds of toast are we going to get out of that? We're all in a time of great scarcity. Do we have enough food? Do we have enough toilet roll? Do we have enough hand sanitizers? Do we have enough ventilators? Do we have enough masks? Do we have enough hospital beds? Do we have enough nurses? No. No, we really don't. And it doesn't matter how many times you wash your hands. You will die. Probably not of coronavirus. Very probably not of coronavirus. But you've already been infected with this human condition. I mean, the human condition is a sexually transmitted disease. It's a chronic terminal illness. And it is definitely a pandemic. We are all afflicted. 100% of the population have it. And there's a 100% death rate. We are in a place of tremendous scarcity. We live in the realm of the flesh. But Jesus comes to bring a realm of the spirit. Have a look at John chapter 6. If you've got a Bible or if you want to look it up on BibleGateway.com, check out John chapter 6. And you'll see Jesus talking about the realm of the flesh, which is a realm of scarcity. It's the realm that we all live in. And the clock is ticking. The sands in the hourglass are passing through. And at some stage, they will run out entirely. But Jesus came to give his flesh that we might live forever with him. This is the life of the Spirit, the life that he has been gushing with from before the foundation of the world. This is the life that he came to give at the cost of his own life. He grants you the life of the Spirit so that beyond this flesh, beyond the coronavirus, beyond this human condition that has infected us all, there is hope. Will you come to Jesus? Will you look to Jesus? Because in him there is abundance. And when you see him, you are seeing the tropical island. Right? No, it's not just that we're living in a desert island. Okay, according to the flesh, these are desert conditions. And all of our supplies are running out. According to the flesh, according to biological reality, that is true. But there is a realm of the Spirit. And Jesus has come in the flesh to give himself for all. That whoever comes to Christ, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. This is the abundance that he brings. 
And when you live with that sense of abundance, when you know that beyond this limited life of the flesh, you have the tropical island, you can break open the supplies and you can share the spam. You can bust out the water bottles. You can be generous because you've been given a vision of abundance. You know that you're saved. You know that you're on your way to abundance and so you can be generous. And this vision of abundance will make you more generous than a thousand commandments because you know you have life. So at this time of desert, at this time of wilderness, at this time of pandemic and of scarcity, let's remember the words of, is it Psalm 73? You can check on this, Psalm 73. Though my flesh and my heart may fail, God is the portion of my heart and my strength forever. God bless.